appreciate you being here on a dreary Thursday afternoon. I'd like to start by saying a couple things about the Institute, about the nature of these talks, and then uh, I'll get into introducing our speaker this evening. Uh, this talk is hosted by the Applied Ethics Institute. What we're trying to do with the Institute is engage in, in topics and subject matter that, that matters to the public and to engage with the public. Um, if you haven't been to a talk before, I want to let you know that the way that these things typically work is that the speaker speaks. Uh, after that happens, we open it up to the floor. I'll ask you to hold your questions and hold your comments, applause, jeering, bananas and tomatoes and whatnot, until after the talk is done. Then we'll hold the speaker up and you can have Adam. Um, I'll start with the bad news. Unfortunately, Jack Weinstein from the University of North Dakota, who is going to pay prepare a case in favor of gun control, or the against guns position, uh, got snowed in. So he can't make it. Uh, we found this out very, very late last night. Despite all of his efforts, he won't be here this evening. Uh, now the great news is we're lucky enough to have Professor Timothy Hall here from Oberlin College in Ohio, who's going to pre present a case uh, in favor of gun ownership. He's going to present an argument for the right to keep and bear arms. Let me tell you a little bit about Professor Hall before I invite him up to the podium. He got his PhD from UCLA in 2003. Prior to going to Oberlin College, he taught at UCLA. He's also taught at Yale and the University of Vermont. He's published pretty extensively on this very topic of gun control and is published in the Journal of Moral Philosophy, Public Affairs Quarterly, Social Theory and Practice, and the Journal of Social Philosophy, amongst many other places. So if you can join me in, in welcoming and thanking Professor Hall for, for being here this evening. All right, good evening. Thank you very much for coming tonight, and I'm looking forward to our discussion this evening. I was very sorry to hear that Professor Jack Weinstein wasn't going to be able to join us tonight. Originally, we had plan for a panel, but it does give me the opportunity when I get back home to say that my arguments were unanswerable. My opponent was unable to respond in any effective way whatsoever, but I'm not going to elaborate on the circumstances, of course. Well, good evening, and as Chris pointed out, I'm going to offer a case tonight for a right to keep and bear arms. And let me say a few things about what I'm going to be assuming in the background in making this discussion, making this argument, rather. If you haven't picked up one, you might want to avail yourselves of copies of the handouts that are back there on the table. I'm going to use the handout in order to explain the argument that I'm offering to you. And it's also a way I can refuse to take responsibility for omitting things that I say. I can just point out that it's a handout. So I certainly need it as a kind of crutch in that respect as well. My own hand I was tripping me up. Good. All right. So one of the things I want to say initially is that the way in which I'm approaching this discussion is to try to offer a case for a right to keep and bear arms that offers a different set of premises than an ordinary kind of discussion about guns, at least in public discussion. So ordinarily, a lot of the discussion about private ownership of firearms occurs within what we might call the empirical social sciences. There are just a lot of questions that are asked and answered with respect to how many people own guns, what kinds of crimes are committed with guns and how often, what defensive efforts are possible and how often do they occur with guns and so on. And to a significant extent, a lot of the public discussion is entirely empirical. In the US as well, there's a kind of legal variant of this discussion, which has to do with the interpretation of the United States Constitution. So today I'm going to offer a somewhat different approach to the discussion. I'm going to try to offer a case that there is a moral right to keep and bear arms. And so some things are important to bear in mind at the outset. I'm going to be taking for granted in the background a, a broadly liberal society. So I'm talking about what we recognize as a modern society, one with some kind of liberally acceptable form of governance, a recognizable suite of liberal political rights, and so on. The details that we assume for purposes of tonight's discussion won't be all that important. 
But bear in mind that something like this is in the, in the background. So I don't necessarily mean my argument to apply to less politically organized societies or societies that have other kinds of more fundamental political problems than a modern, technologically advanced liberal society. And I'm going to be making a case to do with moral rights. And here I distinguish the moral rights from legal rights. The case I make, I would claim, will have implications for what the laws of a society ought to be. But I'm not speaking about legal rights when I use the notion of a right in the discussion tonight. And if you would look at page one of the handout that I've provided, there is another important notion I should introduce at the outset. That's the sense in which I'm going to be talking even about moral rights. And here I want to be clear at the outset that I'm going to be talking tonight only about what philosophers call negative rights. Now, a negative right, loosely speaking, can be thought of as a right you have against another party that they not do things to you. So a right that others not harm you impermissibly or a right that others not steal from you, would be examples of negative rights in the way I'm understanding that notion. In contemporary political philosophy, there's a good deal of discussion about what are called positive rights. If there are positive rights, they're rights that others come to your assistance or provide aid or otherwise offer beneficial labor on your behalf. I'm going to be leaving aside discussion of positive rights altogether in my discussion tonight. So I'll be talking only about rights in the sense of rights against the state, that the state refrain from doing things to us, intervening and interfering, in particular, with private transactions of various kinds. All right, well, so let's turn to the argument in particular. And if you look at step one on page two of the handout that I've provided, the first step of the argument I'm not going to spend much time trying to defend. I'm going to assume that there are liberal political rights, at least of some kind, in the kind of society we're imagining in the background. So if it helps, you can think, for instance, about the possibility that this society has a liberal right of free expression. So for example, this right would include your permission to exercise, uh, to unburden yourself, I should say, of whatever political opinions you have to publish your opinions in ways that they're receivable by an audience beyond the sound of your own voice, a right of others to buy publications of various kinds in which your opinions are contained, and so on. Another kind of liberal right that might help would be, for example, the various kinds of rights that we take to be important in criminal procedure. So rights of the accused, for example, to professional legal counsel during legal proceedings, rights you have during the investigative process in law enforcement against search and seizure absent a warrant and so on. And we can imagine other kinds of liberal rights, but I'm going to take for granted that, for the background purposes of our discussion, we agree there are liberal rights of some kind. And what I'm interested to do is to offer a case based on the kinds of things that must be true for other recognizable liberal rights to be the case, to see whether or not a right to bear arms would be implied too, and I'm going to argue that it is. So the second step in the argument, as I have it there on page two of the handout, is, as I call it, a stringent right of permissible self-defense. There is a stringent right of permissible self-defense. And let me unpack this notion just a little bit before we go on. First, by permissible self-defense, I mean, first, by self-defense, Individuals, private individuals, who defend themselves with violence against wrongful criminal aggression. I'm just going to assume that we agree that there is a moral permission for individuals to do this. I'm not meaning to assume that people may buy and own guns for this purpose, of course. That would make the presentation of the rest of the argument uninteresting. But I am going to assume that, for example, engaging in physical violence, where that's necessary, <laughs> to prevent yourself from being victimized by criminal assault is morally permissible. And I'm going to assume that this is true in cases that I think will be relatively uncontroversial. An, an aggressor with a criminal intent who's attempting to inflict grievous harm or to kill you. In cases like these, I'm going to take it for granted, it's permissible to defend yourself with violence. And we can even assume that this permission is the case only if you have no other effective defensive means available to you, like escape or evasion. Here I mean that we have a right against the state that it refrain from a few things. 
So by a, per, by a right of permissible self-defense, I mean that we have a right against the state, the state not, intervene in permissible defensive acts. I mean that the state may not preempt permissible violent self-defense acts. And I also mean that the state may not preempt individual violent defensive acts, even if the state had a powerful case that doing so would, overall, increase everybody's security. Now, the point here is going to be important in what follows in the rest of the discussion. So, if you would, I'd like you, if you'd like to, to read along and direct your attention to the appendix of the handout, in the very last section of the handout on the last page, is an explication of an example that I hope will help motivate intuitively the claims that I'm offering there under premise two, that there's a stringent right of permissible self-defense. So if you notice there, that section of the handout outlines a hypothetical example. So we imagine a technologically sophisticated, otherwise liberal society in which a technology has been developed. And the technology involves very small, neuronally sensitive electronic devices, which can be implanted in all of the citizens of some society. And by means of the neuronal sensitivity of these devices, our ability to undertake interpersonal violence is preempted. So if, for example, you attempt to fight with somebody else, the electronic devices will simply prevent it. We don't have to imagine that they render you helpless or deliver painful electrical shocks. We can just suppose that, although you're able to act in other ways, you're just prevented from undertaking violence against other people. And to avoid unhelpful complications, we'll imagine that there are, the, there are devices which allow for the temporary deactivation of these electronic chips so people can box or fence with one another for recreational purposes. But otherwise, the chips prevent you from engaging in interpersonal violence. Now, we also suppose that the society, despite the objections of many citizens, legally mandates everyone have one of these devices implanted. Well, let's suppose that the devices are no more intrusive than inoculations, which we suppose the society also mandates to prevent the transmission of dangerous diseases. And the devices don't permit tracking, mind reading, or other kinds of, of interference with us that might raise independent and unhelpful moral questions here tonight. And furthermore, the compliance is universal. So everybody's got one of these devices implanted in them now. However, the technology is imperfect in the following way. There are black market technologies by which prospective criminal aggressors can at least temporarily deactivate their own devices. And when they do, they're able to inflict violence against helpless victims, people who are unable to respond with violence in order to defend themselves. So what I want to suggest about this hypothetical example is the following. That were a society to require everyone to have one of these devices, and secondly, if pretty much everybody had these devices, the people who would be victimized on the infrequent occasions on which criminal aggressors were able to deactivate their own devices have their rights violated by the society. And this is true. I claim, even if the overall levels of violent crime are reduced in that society as compared to what things were like before, before the implantation of the devices. The case is that people who would have been able to defend themselves Absolutely. by violent means are rendered helpless by the state action. They're victimized as a result, and they can claim that their rights have been violated by the state even though the state can say, truthfully, we'll suppose, that requiring these devices universally reduces the crime rate overall, and for each individual, before you know whether you're someone who's going to be victimized or not, your expected security is higher after the universal implantation of these devices than before. So here, what I'm hoping is intuitively, intuitively motivated is the claim that there is a right of self-defense of the kind I articulate in the second premise of this argument. So we're going to move on now. The third premise there on page two of our handout is one where, to my mind, all the philosophical action really occurs in the discussion 
about rights to keep and bear arms in a liberal society. And that premise is somewhat complicated, so we can look at it and take it in some steps. So one of the first things that it's important to be clear about is what I call means rights. Now, I'm taking it for granted, as I said, that there are such things as liberal political rights. And one of the things I'm also taking for granted is that liberal political rights protect important interests of people. Now, in the literature on political rights, there's a good deal of discussion about what kinds of interests are protected by what rights and so on. We can assume that there's some view along these lines that you agree with in the background. It won't make very much difference what we assume about claims of this kind, I don't believe, for the argument I'm offering. But at any rate, when it comes to the right of self-defense, the right of self-defense protects one of the most important interests that people have, namely the interest against being grievously injured or killed by criminal assault. The second thing, though, that I want to make clear about means rights is that not only am I assuming that in the background is a view about liberal political rights on which liberal political rights protect important interests, but that given a liberal right that protects an important interest, there will be, at times, rights of individuals to means by which they satisfy the interest that's protected by the important liberal right expressed more abstractly. An example of what I have in mind might be helpful. So we can return for a moment to the discussion of a liberal right of free speech. What I take it is important to protect in a liberal society is not simply the ability of people through the operation of their own bodies to express opinion to others, but people's ability to acquire external means of the publication of their ideas. Similarly, what's important to protect is not just people's ability to receive and consider ideas expressed within their hearing by a speaker, but to acquire and receive means by which ideas are published. So books, for example, or in an electronic age, it's important that people be able to purchase means by which they might disseminate their ideas electronically electronic devices, computers, and so on, including, for example, the rental, uh, the transmission lines, and all the rest of it. Similarly, people, as part of a liberal right of free speech, presumably, have a right to buy electronic books, physical books, and so on. Now, the claim I'm offering here is that in addition to the liberal right of free speech, we have to notice, there are means rights involved in what we think of as a practically effective right of free speech. What is protected is not simply the expression and receipt of ideas, but the ability each of us has to use and control means by which we might publish our ideas more widely or receive published ideas of others. Our rights, in other words, include rights to means like books, printing presses, or electronic analogs in more sophisticated societies. When there are means that are necessary for people to satisfy the important interest that a liberal right protects at a reasonable cost, then there is, I say, a stringent right to those means. So I mean the claim to be somewhat limited. In a society, for example, where there are a diverse array of means by which important interests would be satisfied, the claim is not that we have a stringent right to all of them, but to at least some of them. The state may not, in other words, prohibit or restrict in ways that would infringe the right all means you might have to the publication and receipt of ideas or to the satisfaction of the important interest that's involved here. All right. Now, there are two other elements to the third premise that are important to touch on for our discussion here now. Steps two and three of the third premise, lowercase Roman numerals two and three, articulate what might be called defeating conditions. So there are some cases in which we don't have rights to means, even if the means might satisfy the important interest that a liberal right protects. One of those cases, when the production, sale, and or use of the means is wrongfully harmful to others. So suppose, for example, that a person invents a new type of book, 
But it turns out the chemical process involved in the manufacture of the book itself poisons any number of people within a vicinity of the factory that produces the books. In that case, there is no right to the production or the dissemination of that means because the production and the dissemination is itself harmful to others. And then the last defeating condition has to do with whether or not there are harms, and in cases of interest to us tonight, crimes that are, as I call it, occasioned by the production and use of means. And here, I'd like to introduce, at least for a moment, the notion of what I call occasioning crime. And this is another topic on which I've been working in political philosophy, and I borrow the phrase somewhat out of use in current discussion from an old work of two legal commentators, H.L.A. Hart and uh, Honor Ray. And the notion of occasioning crime, as I understand it, is defined in the short lexicon I provide on page one of the handout. And briefly, occasioning crime occurs under the following circumstances. An agent A occasions crime against some innocent party C when agent A engages in some kind of activity that creates opportunities for a criminally responsible aggressor, B, to engage in crime against innocent person C. So the idea here is that A is not himself involved in criminal activity, but he acts in ways that create opportunities for crimes undertaken by criminally responsible agents against third parties. That's what I call occasioning crime. And it is, I claim, one of the defeating conditions of liberal means rights that occasioned crimes, what I call override the right. Now, a, a comment about overriding. By the notion of moral rights I have in mind here tonight, as I've said, I mean negative moral rights, rights against others that they not interfere or harm or, to put it loosely, do things to us. But my understanding of rights more broadly is that rights, even serious rights, are not absolute. That though others may not violate our rights whenever more good will come of it, in cases in which enormous harms or catastrophic harms might occur unless certain kinds of activities are undertaken, then rights might be justifiably overridden. So again, a, a case to illustrate the point here might be helpful. And the notion of overriding is also defined on the first page of our handout. So it's often recognized, and I'll recognize it for the sake of our discussion, that innocent people have a right to life. So typical adult human beings have the right that others not kill them wrongfully. Even this right, on my view, is not, for purposes of political philosophy, absolute. So suppose, for example, that the circumstances are such that millions of people within a society will die immediately by means of some terrible immolation, nuclear disaster, what have you, unless one innocent person who wouldn't otherwise be killed is killed. In a case of this kind, the right even against being killed might be overridden. So that where it wouldn't be permissible, I don't believe, to kill one person to distribute his organs among three others, each of whom is dying of the failure of a different organ, in cases in which even the right against being killed, if violated, uh, might bring about the, the protection against enormous harms, then in those cases, a stringent right like that might be overridden. It might be true that it's permissible to undertake action of that kind, even though there is a right against it. So this is a way of articulating what I mean by rights not being absolute, and how, I think, rights might be permissibly overridden in some cases. And I'm taking it for granted that certain political rights, the right of free speech and others, might themselves be overridden in cases of emergency. A society is threatened with extinction and destruction by some hostile neighbor, for example. In an emergency of this kind, it might be permissible for the state to institute, say, censorship. Or in cases in which civil order itself is threatened with complete disintegration, the state might be able permissibly to do away with the ordinary protections in criminal proceedings. But these are cases that would be justifiable only if there's a case for override. That is, where the state is not simply making a case that it's doing more good than harm this way, but where the state is making a case it's preventing overwhelming and disastrous harms. All right. So I've said something then about what I mean by the third premise, 
of the argument I've offered. And one thing I'll say here now in support of the third premise, without stringent means rights, there will be very little scope for effective political rights in liberal society. And again, the case of the right of free speech is a case in point. If there weren't rights to buy and use means, like means of publication, then the scope of a right of free speech would be very limited. So for example, the state agreed, you may say whatever you want to those within your own hearing, but you don't have any right to buy printing presses or to buy books and the like, so that we will regulate the sale and use of these means independent of any question of rights. We'll just regulate the use of those means by way of, say, promoting the kinds of opinion that are best, or as, as well as the state can judge are best. The point being that without rights to the means, there isn't much practical effect to the right of free speech. And there are other kinds of rights that work along these lines, too. Even important rights in criminal proceedings would include, on my notion tonight, negative rights to, say, professional counsel. Well, unless you're permitted to pay a professional to provide you with counsel, the right you have in criminal <coughs> proceedings to professional counsel won't have much practical effect. If the state, for example, says, well, we won't allow anyone to spend money on professional counsel in cases where there's a lot of evidence at indictment, there isn't much of a right to professional counsel in legal proceedings. There is in a formal sense, but not in a practically effective sense. So what I'm trying to say is the case for means rights articulated there under step three is one I take to be general. It's one that liberals ought to be comfortable with across a range of political rights, and not only with respect to the right to keep and bear arms, as I'll try to argue. All right, now we'll turn to step four, given the time we have here. I claim there, under premise four, and this again on page two of the handout, that guns are a necessary means for many people for, in, for permissible interpersonal self-defense at reasonable cost. And now, at long last, four steps into the argument, some empirical information about guns themselves is brought to bear. Now, the concern of premise four is how effective guns are within the context of permissible interpersonal self-defense. So as far as that question goes, there is a kind of first pass common sense approach, and that is, it's fairly obvious that they're very effective and very powerful devices for interpersonal self-defense. So common sense considerations can incline us in this direction, I believe. First, even many proponents of fairly strict gun control or gun prohibition agree that guns are very effective devices for state officials to protect innocent people or to protect important persons from attack, assault, and so on, or to protect valuable items. When government agents in particular or other professionals are charged with duties along those lines, the thought that guns are more effective tools for them to use than anything else now available is not questioned typically, and I think rightfully so, that they're powerful devices for permissible acts of violent self-defense. But there is a fair amount of empirical information as well, as many of you in the audience may be familiar. There's a criminologist at Florida State University, a man called Gary Kleck, who's been quite active in the empirical discussion of firearms for some years. And among the things Kleck has done a couple of different times is analyze the United States Bureau of Justice's National Crime Victimization Survey. The Bureau of Justice is the record keeping and research arm of the United States Department of Justice. And among the things it does every year is offer questionnaires, survey questionnaires, to Americans asking them questions about criminal victimization. And to cut to the chase, Kleck says he finds evidence in examining these surveys that when individuals try different ways to protect themselves against violent crime, the use of guns is the single most effective tactic to prevent themselves from being criminally victimized. It's more effective, Kleck finds in this evidence, than attempting to flee, evading, resisting with no weapons whatsoever, or resisting with other weapons. The use of guns is effective in cases where other kinds of means tend not to be, against multiple attackers and against others who are armed with guns, for example. The claim is not that they're perfectly effective, and the claim is not even that the use of guns can never make things worse, but the claim is that, on balance, you're better off in your attempt to survive a violent encounter 
according to Collect, is using a gun to protect yourself than by these other possible means of defense. So he says. At any rate, though, that's some of the empirical information that lies behind premise four. So premise five is a fairly straightforward claim, and it's one on which I'm not going to spend a lot of time. The production, sale, purchase, and use of guns for permissible interpersonal self-defense is not itself wrongfully harmful to others. There are only two considerations I'm going to offer in favor of this premise right now. The first is that manufacture, sale, purchase, and possession of guns are not themselves harmful. Possessing a gun is not harmful. Making one, selling it, those things are not harmful. The use of guns in permissible interpersonal self-defense is at least threatening and might well be harmful, but it's not wrongfully harmful. And that's by the assumption that some violent acts of self-defense are permissible, and those are the ones I mean to refer to. So again, cases in which the only way in which you can save your own life from criminal aggression aimed at your murder is to shoot the aggressor. Those are cases, I claim, in support of premise five, that are certainly harmful to the aggressor, but not wrongfully so. So premise five is one on which I don't think we're going to have a lot of controversy centered. Or so I expect, but you never know. Premise six is an important step. So here the claim is that we have to recognize, as I think is true, that even given what I've tried to argue so far is a legitimate purpose for private use of guns, interpersonal self-defense, some wrongful use will be occasioned on the basis of the legitimate manufacture and traffic in guns. So the thought here is that we recognize, as part of the discussion, that some criminal aggressors will be incented to undertake crimes and will succeed in crimes only because of firearms they acquire parasitically on the legitimate manufacture and trafficking in firearms. So the worry here is about crime that is, as I call it, occasioned by the manufacture, trafficking, and use of guns for legitimate self-defense purposes. Now, there is a subtle nuance involved in evaluating this claim. What to make of occasioning crime? So what about a case in which, say, you're making weapons, you are intending to sell the weapons to people who will use them only for rightful defensive purposes, but you realize that sooner or later some of these weapons will be stolen, someone might provide some false identification or otherwise evade your controls, or someone who isn't subject to the formal controls will buy the weapon with an intent to do harm. And they do. Is the original manufacturer of the weapon then a kind of harming of the eventual victim? Well, I argue morally it's not. And part of the reason for this is that although it is a kind of creation of threatening conditions, it isn't on a moral par with paradigmatic cases of doing harm. So if your factory emits fumes, for example, that poison bystanders nearby, you harm them. What you do is wrong and it's a violation of their rights. If you create devices that, given the criminal intent of others, might, part, might be part of the plan of a criminal aggressor by which they harm others, you occasion crime, but what you do isn't, I think, on a par with a paradigmatic case of harming. And it's the kind of thing that if you're doing it to protect really important interests of other people, you're permitted to do. And part of the rationale is the rightful production of these means necessary to protect important interests shouldn't be held hostage to wrongful behavior of others. This is part of the structure of the rights involved in these cases, I believe. Then there's an empirical leg to the discussion of occasioning crime. How bad are things as a result of the trafficking in firearms for ordinary uh, justifiable purposes? Well, this too is ultimately a matter for professionals in the social sciences. But that said, the case that things are so bad as a result of private manufacture, sale, trafficking, and guns that even if there is a right to these things, and a right that protects the most important interests people have in defending their own lives, that right is overridden. The case for that is, I think, much weaker than casual proponents of various forms of gun control often assume. Part of the reason has to do with the fact that, for example, although the United States has very high levels of gun prevalence, its levels of violent crime, in some respects too high compared to some other societies, but not off the charts in comparison to countries like, say, the United Kingdom, which overall, on some measures, has even higher levels of violent crime than the United States. There are other societies, Switzerland, Finland, and so on, which have high levels of gun ownership, 
fairly low levels of violent crime. And then internally in the United States, there's a good deal of variation. Areas in the country that have very high levels of gun density, like rural Ohio, where my institution is, have very low rates of crime or lower rates of crime in the country. And areas with low gun density, the more urban areas in the country, have very high levels of violent crime. So even internally in the country, there is not the suggestion in any obvious way that the effects of gun prevalence, which themselves are the effect of legitimate manufacturing and trafficking guns, are overriding for the right in question. But as I say, this is an empirical question. We can talk more about it. But the claim of premise six is that whatever harms do result from the occasioning of crime, they don't rise to overriding levels. The last step in the argument is the claim that the stringency of the right to keep and bear arms is on a par with the stringency of the right of self-defense. And here, just another bit of terminology ought to be introduced. Two, two bits of terminology, really. First, stringency. Remember, I talked about the possibility of overriding rights a little while ago. The thought was that even important rights might permissibly be overridden if so doing would prevent enormous harms from occurring. Stringency is the right's difficulty in being overridden. Very stringent rights have very high thresholds for bad harms to be prevented for permissible overriding. So the right to life, the right of typical adult human beings against being killed, has a very high threshold for being overridden. If it's ever permissible to do that, it's to prevent enormous harms from occurring. So that's the idea. How stringent is the right to keep and bear arms? Well, here too, it's probably worth a pause to say something about what I mean by the right to keep and bear arms. And that's detailed there in the lexicon section of the handout. That's a compound right, and I use the expression because it echoes broadly in American discussion, but I mean by it something a bit broader than is meant in the ordinary legal discussion. As I say there, there's two elements. The right of individuals to buy, use, and keep some kinds of guns for permissible interpersonal self-defense, including carrying outside the home for personal protection. And secondly, the right of private property owners to manufacture and trade in some kind of guns that are necessary means for this form of interpersonal defense. So the claim of step seven is that the right involved here is stringent. It's as stringent as the right of self-defense articulated in premise two. So the claim involved in the right of self-defense is, and again, I'm harkening back to premise two, that the state may not implant everybody with these violence-inhibiting devices unless the alternative involves catastrophic or enormous harms. Now maybe you would, and you might be able to show this empirically, but something like that, I claim, is analogous to what might be true, for instance, in a liberal society in a more realistic context. The state were considering weakening the protections in criminal proceedings. Imagine the state of New York or the state of Ohio showed that if they did away with the requirement for warrants and searches and seizures, or if, for example, the kinds of evidence necessary for indictment and conviction was lessened, then overall rates of crime would drop significantly. Overall security, suppose, would get better, where security here is constituted by two things, the freedom from crime against one and the freedom from wrongful conviction. So imagine the state made a case that if they weakened protections in criminal proceeding, they said, truthfully suppose, your chances of being wrongfully convicted of some crime and punished would go up, but this would be more than compensated for by the decline in the occurrence of crime, and so everyone's security would increase. Well, the claim involved in this kind of example that I would offer would be, this would violate people's rights, the rights involved that people have against the state are also stringent, and it's the same kind of point that I think can be made about the right of self-defense. Step seven claims that the means right to own and use guns has a stringency comparable to that of the right of self-defense introduced in the second premise. Why? Because as I've said in the earlier steps, the means here would be those that are necessary for people to satisfy their important interests at a reasonable cost. 
That's what we're assuming for purposes of the seventh premise is true of the means we have in mind. Without these means, some very important interests that people have won't be able to be satisfied. The state's preventing people from acquiring and using these means then is protected by a right, and that right is stringent, comparable to the right of self-defense introduced in the second premise. Okay, everyone, everyone see? All right. And so the conclusion that in circumstances mirroring those of the contemporary United States and perhaps those of other first world countries, there is a stringent right to keep and bear arms. This is the case offered here. One quick objection. Notice you might say too, as some people do, about gun control, that if we, if we restrict private ownership and trade in guns, then everyone's expected security will increase. But the reply to this objection is much along the lines that I've just articulated. That even if people's security calculated ex ante, that is prior to knowing who will be victimized and who wouldn't, is increased, people whose guns are prohibited and who are then victimized by crime only because they didn't possess a gun will have their rights violated as a result. Again, in much the way it would be true if the state reduced its protections in criminal proceedings and thereby increased everybody's expected security. All right, well, that's the case, as I offer it, for a stringent liberal right to keep and bear arms. So I'm happy to pause now for questions. Thanks. Thank you very much for that. I uh, come here that I will pass around to those of you who would like to ask a question. So I just ask that you put up your hand, and I will put you on the queue, and uh, we can engage in some discussion here. Thanks so much for your presentation. Uh, I'd like to go back to, I think, point two. All right, please. Yeah. And I would like to ask if you could please explain in a little more detail uh, B, C, and D. So why is it that my why is it that my own act of self-defense is inherently more protected or, or more valuable than someone else acting in my in oh, my, right. on my behalf? Yeah. If I were guaranteed right. a policeman would oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. protect me. <laughs> no, of course. Yeah, no, it's a very good question. And so and, and I see exactly why you're asking it. But what I mean is by the second premise is not that you know, there's a policeman right by your side, and he could intervene on your behalf. I'm not saying that in that case, you, though, have the right to work, work over the aggressor. You know, I'm not making that claim. The claim would be, for example, that imagine the policeman only had the ability to stop you, but didn't have any power to intervene against the aggressor. In that case, if you would be able to protect yourself and someone stopped you, he shackled your hands or held your hands behind your back, and then you were aggressed against as a result, then your right would be violated. That's what I mean. So good, yeah. So the idea is, and, and this is supposed to apply, you know, you might think, well, how is that realistic? Well, that kind of case isn't, but if the state, for example, criminalized violent self-defense, so that if you engaged in it, then you were subject to serious punishment afterward, even if what you were doing was morally right, that would violate your right, your right to self-defense. That's the idea. Yeah, good. Um, thank you very much for the talk. I just, yeah. Very good. So I have a question about when the right to keep and bear arms is violated. So yeah. you, at the end, you talk about gun prohibition <laughs> and some gun restrictions. But I'm just wondering, so in the means right, you say a right to a means necessary to satisfy the interest protected by a liberal right at a reasonable cost. Yeah. And so I'm wondering, can you have any sort of gun control laws? Can you say, well, there are waiting periods or background checks yeah. or... You can have, you know, guns but not assault rifles or something. Does that count with reasonable cost? Or yeah. how do you decide when the right to keep and bear arms is violated? No, that's a very good question, and I'm glad you asked, because it actually touches on one of the elements of the case that I think is distinctive to my own view, and this is a paper I published a few years ago, is there a right to bear arms? And, it, and the reason that the reasonable cost expression is in there as part, as you're anticipating, is because the... A question about how much regulation the state can impose can, I think, be addressed by appeal to what a reasonable cost is 
for people who want to acquire and use the means. So, and we're talking about what, what a right you have here. And so the idea, remember, if, is if you have a right, this is going to stop the state even from doing more good than harm. So there has to be a serious kind of case for a right of that kind. So, at, so I was thinking, well, what if the state doesn't prohibit guns, they just tax them somewhat? As long as it's within what I call the requirement of a reasonable cost to you, then the state can do things like that. So detailed questions. What about a waiting period and so on? You, you know, well, this too. You, you know, how, the, the possibility that you might need a gun urgently might make the imposition of a waiting period unreasonable. On the other hand, you might try to make the case, well, look, it's not like you had never thought of the possibility of violent interpersonal defense until this time. And so, you know, it's the kind of thing you want to try to prepare for, like buying a fire extinguisher or something like that. In that case, you might try to say the waiting period is reasonable. I don't want to take a view on every single detailed possibility of gun regulation. But as you're anticipating, that's the idea. There's another important element, too. Permissible interpersonal self-defense. So one of the means, one of the ways to evaluate whether you have a right to means is whether they really are means to permissible interpersonal self-defense. So what about, for example, area bombs? You might say, well, you know, I'm not so good with a gun, so I'm going to buy a bomb. But the bomb is so powerful, it'll, it'll destroy everything within dozens of yards around it. If you used it and innocent people were killed, even when you were protecting yourself, that would be wrong on my view. And so that kind of thing doesn't, it isn't even the kind of thing that you would get the right for as a means of permissible interpersonal self-defense. And then lastly, interpersonal self-defense is what I focused on in the paper. There is another kind of case, a historical Republican case with a small r for Republican, that one of the important uses of private weapons is to intimidate governments, to, to provide defense of citizens against governments. I do think what I call the reasonable cost account of rights could be applied to that case. But it's, it's different. It has different kinds of considerations involved. But I didn't mean to speak to that. So you might say, well, look, sure, a handgun is fine if, if someone nearby tries to break in. But you know, if the state of New York comes crashing into the backyard, I'm going to need a warplane and powerful artillery and so on. But I'm not making a case for the possibility of the use of these weapons against the state here. So that, uh, that's some of what speaks to the issue. Thanks. Well, uh, my question is, do you think that the Castle Doctrine and Stand Your Ground laws take the right of self-defense too far? Do you think that there's a limit to the right of self-defense as in, uh, in regards to how exactly you defend yourself? Can you shoot to kill? Um, can you stand your ground and fight when you have the choice to flee? Yeah. Yeah, no, that's another good question. Well, one of the things I try to do is to as much as possible, first try to make a case that there really is a right to bear arms, keep and bear arms, without necessarily having to take on more controversial premises than are necessary. So I could, what I see myself as being able to do for the purposes of the argument anyway is to say, you're not permitted to kill an aggressor in self-defense morally if you could just escape. You could just step behind the door and close it and you're safe. You're not permitted, if you have that option, to kill an aggressor who's otherwise trying to murder you, I was, I was supposing. But what about the idea that you ought to be able to, to go about your rightful business and not be under legal compulsion to have to deviate from that simply because of wrongful threats by aggressors against you? There is a case for this, and this is, there is, that's the moral case in, you know, that is at least part of the reason behind what are called stand your ground laws. And just for informational purposes, if some of you are not aware, the idea is that under the stand your ground laws, as they are in many states, and as has been recently passed in Ohio, for example, you are not under a legal duty to flee as a means of defending yourself from grievous attack or being killed when you have a legal right to be where you are. So if you're in a public area and lawfully in that place, someone aggressing against you doesn't put you under any legal duty to flee even if fleeing would allow you to escape safely with no harm to the aggressor. That's, those are the kinds of laws that are being asked about. Anyway, that was, so I think there is something to be said for them, but I, I didn't mean to, or I don't see myself as having to make a more controversial claim than that you're morally permitted to kill when you have no safe opportunity to escape for the purposes of my paper. Thanks. Thanks very much. Again, I've got a question. Yeah. Uh, I'd like to talk about what I think is a relationship between point four and point six. Okay, good. Uh, and maybe I'll play Jeff McMahon here. 
All right, yeah. Uh, okay, let me see where I can start here. Um, the fact that the crime occasioned by the manufacturer trade and the use of guns and permissible personal self defense does not rise to overriding levels seems to rest on a particular background assumption, and that's that there's necessarily guns already, or that there's necessarily um, such a, a high ownership or influx of guns in society that one actually does need a gun to protect himself, that that is the most efficient means. Um, because if we look at guns that are a necessary means for many for permissible interpersonal self-defense, the reasonable cost for, that may not be the case if we call for already prohibition of guns except for in the hands of the military or the police. Yeah. Um, and, and some people are going to say that, is it Kleck? Yeah, that the Kleck's claim is, is pretty skewed because guns don't often actually save people. And I mean, social science is tough. If you ask right. people if a gun saved them, they can say, yeah, yeah. yeah, it saved me because I feel safer in my house and I feel that people wouldn't come into my house if I had a gun. Yeah. So perhaps the rate at which people report them protecting them is skewed. Uh, right. Thereby justifying. Okay, people. yeah. So good comments and, and you know some good things to think about. One is, one way I understand what you're asking me about is first, when I make the claim, as I do, that the crime occasioned by legitimate trafficking in guns is not overriding. Maybe I'm taking for granted a high prevalence, high gun prevalence society in the first place. Because you know, if there were very few guns, and then we imagine widespread <clears throat> possession of guns against that background, it might seem like so much more crime occurs that there is overriding. And it might be different, you might think, if everyone already has guns anyway, and there's little prospect of prohibition actually affecting gun scarcity, then you might think, well, the case that gun prohibit that, that gun use doesn't involve overriding arms is better, you know, something like that. Yeah. Well, two things I guess to say about this. Um, so yeah, as you say, social science is difficult and so on. For now, if one conceded that what had to be shown was not just that more harm than good comes from gun ownership, but overriding levels of harm, that would be an important result. You know? uh, another thing, though, that's, that's worth pointing out that also complicates the social science, it is, to my mind, appropriate for proponents of a right to bear arms to say the claim that gun prohibition would prevent enormous harms has to be made against a background where the criminal justice system is otherwise pretty crime preventing and well organized and the like, including, for example, the possibility, if you thought this, of changing laws in ways that didn't otherwise involve any rights being violated. So in particular, one common claim that's often made about violent crime is that the criminalization of various kinds of drugs results in a lot of violence because of the value of the black markets involved. And although in the real country, a social scientist might be evaluating gun prohibition or gun permission against a background with drug prohibition. A proponent of the right to bear arms could claim, I think, that what needs to be evaluated for purposes of whether or not the right is overridden is how much crime there would be if the state otherwise had its act together and what, you know, wasn't engaged in defending certain kinds of legal structures that are really harmful and foolish and all the rest of it. So it's yet another complication as far as the social science goes. And, yet, you know, then the details, you compare the US to, I don't know, a country like the UK, which is very similar in many ways. It does have very high levels of violent crime, though uh, you know, about half the rates of homicides across the US as a whole. But still, in other ways, it, it, you, you know, there are, are some measurements on which the UK has even higher rates of violent crime overall, when you can aggravate assault, rape, robbery, and murders together. And of course, the UK is a very low gun prevalence society, whatever else might be said about it. And, but really, you know, that's the social science. And if it turns out that way, then even this argument wouldn't vindicate gun rights. And, and you kind of think, well, if it really were override, I mean, if you were convinced that if the state changed its laws so that they were more rational and crime suppressing in the first place, um, and you know, did other things, you know, so provided information, so gun use was taken seriously and there was responsibility and all these other things. But it's still, we were convinced that there's all this harm and it's so bad it's over, right?
Well, I mean, you, you know, then uh, there's very little that would withstand, you know, that possibility. And yeah, so anyway, so that's what I have to say. Thanks. Yeah, that's a good, yeah, good, good set of questions. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, yeah, please. I'd actually really like to follow up on that. Uh, yeah. Since whether deny you your your opponent here playing Jeff yeah. Jarrett again, um, one yeah. of the things that, that I came away from his talk with was the he seems to advocate why don't we let the police do it instead? Yeah. What if we lived in a world where the police force prevented yeah. violent crime against right. me? Uh, yeah. It's a hypothetical situation, but so are some of the situations we've constructed in this argument. Yeah. And I, I'm just curious if you have a response to that and what that would mean to the, the yeah. right. Does that count as another suitable means? Yeah. That yeah. Will, and and how, how would you approach it? It does. That? I mean, you know, so I'm assuming permissible interpersonal self-defense against a background of professional police services and all the rest. I mean, I mean, and that's how things are right now, you know. But I'm glad you asked about this. It's, you know, Jeff McMahon, he's a friend of mine, and he's a great philosopher, and he and I participated in a panel on guns about a year ago, and so I got to hear a lot of his views on this topic. At least as he was presenting the view the last time I was talking with him about it, I understand one of the important differences between Jeff and me to be along these lines. The example I have toward the back of the handout, the one with the electronic chips, <coughs> Jeff would say that in a case like this, or I, maybe he would, I don't know, but, you, you know, Someone occupying a position like his would say that there is no rights violations involved, even for people who are harmed only because they're unable to defend themselves violently. It's more like conscription in, a, in wartime. So, you know, the state's invaded and is fighting a just defensive war. It conscripts people. Some people are injured or killed in that war. But though that kind of thing doesn't count as a rights violation for those individuals. They're, they're regrettable effects of a policy that's justifiable, but no one's rights are violated. That's the idea. But I, don't, I, I reject that. I mean, I mean, I think, you know, part of the picture I have in the background is that individuals possess rights, and those rights demand respect from the state, even within a liberal political society. So that compromising the security of individuals by removing their ability to defend themselves is a rights violation, even if the overall effect of that whole policy is to reduce levels of criminal aggression to what they were before. And even if, before anyone knew who was going to get aggressed and who wasn't, everyone's chances were better under the system with the chips. I mean, so there are other ways to make the point. I made the point about the criminal justice system. If we reduce protections in criminal proceedings and everybody's safer, at least beforehand, still, I think, that possibility is consistent with people having their rights violated when they're wrongfully convicted only because of the reduced criminal protections. Uh, you know, and, and that's the same kind of thing I think can be said about your ability to get means to protect yourself. You know, I mean, comparable kinds of things might be said, for instance, about those jurisdictions that prevent people from buying purely defensive items, like bulletproof vests or doors that are really hard to break down. And you might say, well, look, I mean, true, it makes the job a little more difficult for police when criminals have these items, but Individuals can protect themselves against criminal aggression with these devices, and isn't there something in itself objectionable about, as it were, sacrificing the defensive interests of some to bring about greater good? I mean, that's exactly the kind of thing that rights tell against, and I just think there is this kind of right, and guns are a means to satisfying the interest that the right protects. Yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, I, perhaps my statement is unfair and, and not consistent though, with your presentation because I come from a political, legal, constitutional perspective and I don't come from a moral perspective. But I have some, some issues in terms of legal and constitutional right to bear arms uh -huh. which bear on your, okay, your, good. your yeah. discussion. Yeah. But one, let, let, let's deal with the self-defense argument for a moment. Uh, from, my, from my perspective, and I don't have the statistics in front of me, but a high percentage of violent crime are crimes of passion. And crimes of passion often uh, result in death or injury yeah. because of the accessibility and availability of crime. Yeah. So as far as I'm concerned, the possession of a gun has very little to do with self-defense. Oh. Yeah. There are other ways to defend yourself other than guns for the defense of property. When it comes to the defense of life, most injury 
comes from crimes of actions with the availability of a weapon. So remove the weapon, and you arguably are protecting the most fundamental right, which is life. Secondly, and I really take issue with the fact that uh, your convention ignore the, quote, small Republican problem, because that is the root of the Second Amendment. Many people who argue the Second Amendment argue that it is rooted in a political need to keep the democracy safe uh, from, uh, from tyranny using the Minuteman argument yeah, yeah. and the like. I, I for one, don't buy in that because it just doesn't make sense that, that, uh, that we're going to rise up and defend ourselves in a revolution because the social contract is violent. But it, it seems to me that most of the major arguments for gun control are based on other issues like the right to privacy, the right to own property, the right to uh, uh, to assert civil liberties uh, when the government is abusive. Uh, self-defense, I would argue, is the least of, of the arguments because self-defense is protected in a multitude of other ways than owning a gun. In fact, owning a gun is probably one of the least effective ways to protect someone. In fact, it, uh, it invites violence rather than protect violence. So I would argue that the central theme that the moral right is self-defense and the protection of one's life is immaterial compared to the other arguments as to why we have gun control. I don't buy the other arguments, but they are certainly argued with a more compelling passion than the one about self-defense. Yeah, well, all right. Well, you certainly have argued about, about, about these, <laughs> along these lines, and, and I thank you for the comments. So two things, really. I want to address the first thing we started with and finished with first, the, the question about whether an appeal to a permission to engage in violent self-defense is a worthwhile basis for the right to bear arms. Well, I, you know, I think it is. I mean, I don't agree with you, first of all, that there really isn't much reason to think that guns are important tools for protecting oneself against criminal violence. I, as I said, when we're thinking about say, professional police, whose job it is to interact and coerce occasionally wrongdoers, the thought that guns don't make them more powerful with respect to accomplishing these justifiable ends, you know, that strikes me, you know, it's almost unserious. I mean, of course, they're better protected in, in winning criminal encounters than with guns than without them. Why, and, and of course, again, too, you know, the fact that criminals are more dangerous in their aggression with guns than without them, that's part of also what's taken for granted as far as common sense in the background here goes. Why should lawful defenders be the only ones whose powers are not enhanced by possession and use of guns in this triad of parties we're imagining? I mean, it just, it, it strikes me as, uh, there's kind of, I mean, it's an empirical claim, but it's very suspicious that, uh, to me, that the effectiveness of guns when it comes to private defensive purposes is so subject to doubt, whereas in the background these other things are taken for granted. The, 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 the issue about how often guns are used is, is important in a couple of ways. You know, how often is it true that guns are actually used in criminal encounters? This is a hard thing to measure, it's true. And again, ultimately it's an empirical question, but it's worth pointing out that police attention is usually drawn to those cases in which guns are fired. Like there may be many cases in which guns are brandished or otherwise made apparent, in which they're defensively effective, but which are otherwise hard to know to record in a systematic way. There's also the fact that it's widely known that at least a lot of homes in the United States are homes with guns in them. And certain kinds of crimes are very uncommon in the US compared to other kinds of societies um, that are comparable in some ways. So for instance, I, I, I wish I had the figures here in front of me, but I do know that burglary of occupied residential premises in the U.S. is a very uncommon kind of burglary, but it's much more common in the United Kingdom than it is in the United States. And at least part of the reason that seems to suggest itself, and I know a reason that some criminologists claim this is true, is precisely because it's so widely known that so many Americans have guns in their homes and can defend themselves with those guns against people who break into the homes while the residents are there. So the point I'm trying to make more broadly is that guns have a kind of deterrent effect that's kind of hard to measure. You know, what, what kinds of aggressions are people willing to undertake knowing that prospective victims are armed can be hard to measure if the deterrence is effective. So, but then ultimately, you know, there's a kind of empirical question and so that has to be said. One final comment on this topic. The 
point, you know, other rights, rights to privacy or just rights to own property, I actually think those would be weaker bases as a moral matter for a right to keep and bear arms, precisely because, you know, you might, so, well, if I had legal permission to buy a small nuclear reactor, then you, you might say, well, and I have some moral right to property to use means for my ends and so on. But that I have some interest that's not one of my most important interests. It's, you know, maybe I'm curious about them or I just like that kind of technology. It seems to me that ultimately the strength of the moral right will depend on the strength of the interest or the importance of the interest that the right's supposed to protect. And that, that you have a right to own property creates a moral case that I still think is dependent on the, the interests you have in the ownership and the use of the property that you own. One last point. I don't want you to misunderstand. I wasn't meaning to discount or say something adverse about the claim that private gun ownership might deter unjust governments from violence against the citizenry. It's really for just expository purposes and the fact that this is the argument I got interested in and developed that I offered you here. That I, I, you know, you were right to point out that for these purposes I ignored this older argument. But it's not because I think there's nothing to it or that it's not serious. I just didn't discuss it here. Yeah, thanks. Um, well, thank you for coming tonight. And um, just like to say that I really liked your argument in Appendix 130, for example. Hmm. But I have another question. So um, when you talked about how machine guns weren't, weren't really um, a reasonable cause for using for self-defense, but a handgun was a reasonable hmm. cause for using for self-defense. The reason that was so is because we have um, less people, say, killed with a handgun versus a machine gun. So if we look at the same way, so why the knife versus the handgun? With a knife, you kill less people, but you still have the potential yeah. to you know, pr um, protect yourself. So we're <coughs> using the similar um, basis for no machine guns, but handguns are Right. So why can't we say that about? Yeah, good question. All right, so one thing to be clear about, what the right I'm claiming a person has generally is a right to means that are necessary to satisfy the interest of that person at a reasonable cost. So the right is that you're able to acquire and use the means at a reasonable cost to you of the acquisition and use of the means. And the bit about the reasonable cost is supposed to give some practical limits to other things the state can do other than outright prohibition. So suppose the state says, okay, guns are legal, but there's a $20,000 tax on every gun. Well, you know, they'll say, well, look, it's formally legal. We're not stopping anybody. The claim is they're making the cost unreasonably high, where it would otherwise have been reasonable notice. And that's, so that's what the reasonable cost clause is doing in the, in the case there. So I was saying, too, though, that the right I'm thinking of is the right of permissible interpersonal self-defense. And so part of what we would do in evaluating whether there is a means right is asking of some prospective means, is it a means to that behavior, permissible interpersonal self-defense? And I thought guns like handguns and maybe some rifles have some things going for them. First, they're targetable in a way that area bombs or poison gas isn't. And so the possibility that what you're doing wouldn't involve the wrongful killing of innocent people in defending yourself is much more creditable in the case of guns than, I don't know, a bomb or something like that. The, the other issue, though, that's relevant is that guns are really effective. They're a lot more effective than knives for these purposes. That's why police have sidearms and not just knives, because the guns are a lot better, and the reasons for that are pretty obvious, I think. Now, what kinds of guns are protected? Is a, it is a somewhat nuanced question, and I, to be honest, I haven't offered a lot to say about that. And there, too, might be a case where the borders are somewhat fuzzy and so on. For interpersonal defense, perhaps it's true that what the right protects for that purpose. Things like handguns, maybe rifles of various kinds, even semi-automatic rifles with magazines of 20 or 30, I don't know, something like that. When you're thinking about interpersonal criminal aggression, maybe that's all you can really say that the right protects. I'm not sure exactly where the boundary is. But I was thinking, okay, here's some obvious cases outside the scope of the argument I'm offering. A warplane, an area bomb, a poison gas delivery device, you know, even moats filled with acid or you know, dangerous animals like bears roaming around in your property that can get loose and hurt other people. I was thinking, all right, leave those aside. But I think a handgun or a shotgun for rifles of various kinds for interpersonal defense, that seemed to me okay. Exactly where the boundary is, yeah, I'm not sure, but right, good. Anyway, that's what I have to say. Good, thanks. If I can ask one more question. Yeah, please. 
So I'll ask a question that doesn't involve self-defense, but it still involves protecting one's interests. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I think part of the difficulty that some people have with, with people owning guns is that there's very little um, competitive advantage for authorities when people own guns, yeah. right? You said maybe a knife uh, just might not be as effective. Um, so everyone walked around who was a citizen with knives, we could still maintain order effectively. But so part of the difficulty is police lose or have a lesser ability to do their job because we all have these things. And so in other avenues, we are granted rights to look out for our best interests. And what popped into my head was, was our luggage. Uh, we all hate that people can go through our luggage and whatnot, but we have TSA locks. There's an ultimate authority granted to people to open up our luggage. So we can lock our things to protect it from other people, but in the event that they think they'll harm someone, or what's in our luggage might harm someone, they have overall authority. They sort of have a trump card. And that's gone if we have guns. Yeah. Well, you know, interesting kind of question. And, and in some ways, it gets at what you might think of as the heart of the thinking about the state's regulatory powers and so on. You know, even figures like Hobbes and Locke thought of the security and individual's protection of security as part of the foundation of the state as any kind of voluntary arrangement at all. I mean, that was an important element, the whole point of anything like political organization altogether. And, I, and when I think about, say, Locke, it, it, I also think, though, that, at least as I read him, part of the story for Locke was that we gain a lot of advantage from political organization, and security is part of that. I mean, for Locke, too, there was also the, the final arbitration. So there's a judge that everyone recognizes the one who's going to settle disputes. That's a big deal. But it's also true that we have you know, this entity with enforcement powers that are pretty unchallenged and can do a good job vindicating our rights and so on. But even someone like Locke recognizes there are cases in which there's no time to take down evidence and go get the magistrate or to call the king's men to come and defend you. And those cases Locke seemed to think were cases in which you retain your natural right to defend yourself. And so I agree with it. I think you know, political society has to be respectful of the fact that we're individuals or our own purposes and plans and our ability to protect our own lives is something that you know, can't just be reckoned in a utilitarian way. That's kind of the idea. So you know, with that kind of point in mind, the idea would be, let's suppose, you know, that it's true generally, suppose, though I, I think there's reason to doubt it, that pretty much anybody owning a gun becomes a problem for police who might try to enforce the law. Well, even if that's true, I, I guess I still think that the overriding way of reckoning things is the relevant one to bring to bear, given that the guns have this interpersonal defensive power. But I don't know that it is true. I mean, after all, you, you, you know, there are plenty of people in the U.S. who own firearms who nevertheless subject themselves to orderly criminal proceedings rather than fighting it out with a sheriff each and every time, including you know, going through the prosecution for very serious crimes and so on. And it's not just, you know, the state not only has somewhat better weapons, but it has everything. I mean, many more people to call upon and, and so on and so on. All the things it had in the 18th century when armaments were fairly more even between the state and citizens. So I, I'm not, you know, I'm not persuaded that the crime occasioning effect of guns is so dramatic as to threaten the possibility of functioning law and order at all. You know, I think, you know, there's plenty of reason to think that law-abiding people will still be intimidated by appropriate legal forms of authority and so on. But that's, so that's the idea. I mean, you can guess. I mean, I take it that, I don't know. What I'm saying, I'm sure, is not that surprising. These lines of reply, but that's the idea, you know. Yeah, I mean, much, you know, look, the parallel is sort of older views about speech. You know, there were some who, these older views would have it that, of course, the state may regulate speech. Subversive or anti government speech is very dangerous. You know, there's the threat of re reducing respect for authority, and, and of course, that challenges the very notion of the state itself. And it does. I mean, it can be hard to maintain awe and respect when your citizens are free to mock you as much as they like. It's not. But, you know, I think even if it does have that tendency, that doesn't undermine the kind of rights-based calculus in that case. So something like that is what I'd say about this, too. Thanks. Last call for questions. Now, well, join me in thanking. Yeah, thank you.
Please help yourself to coffee or juice or cookies on your way out. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. What's your name? I am. What are you studying?